God was good to me before I ever got saved. Amen? Amen. Second Thessalonians. I want you to take God's Word and turn with us there in to the book of Second Thessalonians, chapter number 2. Uh, I want to thank the Lord this morning publicly for directing me to this uh, passage of Scripture and for the message this morning. But I did not anticipate on him giving us a real live object lesson, amen, for part of my message this morning. I don't know if how many of you, how many of you felt the tremor of the, of the earthquake that was in Sparta, North Carolina, they say. I don't feel bad if you didn't feel it because I didn't either. Uh, I was outside, I had done in the swing, that might have been why, you know, just swinging and, and I was doing my devotion. And I got done with that, and I, and I gave one of my animals some water, and was, and was I never, never, I'll come back in the house, and my wife was saying, I thought you'd fell out of the bed. And all this stuff. I said, I've been up over an hour, and you think I'm, you know, so anyway, see, she gets comical sometimes. Her and her mom gets on the phone, and they get to talking about all these things, and then, I don't know, it was about 30 minutes later, and her phone started lighting up like a Christmas tree, you know, and that group of all you ladies got to text about all of that. And I said, boy, the Lord sure is good, amen. He's given me an object lesson and just and presenting it before I ever get to church, amen, for the message. So I hope that uh, the Lord will help us uh, get some uh, good, good word today and, uh, and thank Him. I thank Him publicly for directing us this way and giving us the object lesson this morning of uh, the tremor of the earthquake. Don't feel bad. I don't know how you, I was sitting. This has been several years ago in the church there in the, in, the, in the study that is now the nursery there in the sanctuary. And I, I felt something. I, you know, I'm sitting there and, you know, the, the, everything shakes and I'm thinking, Somebody's done run into the church. I thought a car had come in there and, 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 and hit the church, the corner of the church. I go outside and I walk around and I said, well, I don't know what the devil that was. It wasn't nobody running in. I come back in and then, it, then I realized it was, you know, word and news and it was uh, one of those tremors. So anyways, here we go. Notice here, uh, chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians, verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word, uh, nor by letter as from us, as that day, the day of Christ, is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there first come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition." who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is, so he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know that, with, uh, that withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he... Uh, who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions that ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and have given us everlasting consolation and good hope through the grace, uh, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. We thank you, God, 
for allowing us to meet once again in this way. God, we ask your blessings upon us. You'd fill us with the Spirit of God. Help us to preach the message you've laid upon our heart for this morning's service. And God, I pray that you would touch and bless and just have your way. Do, Father, what only you can do in this service. Speak to every heart. Comfort our hearts through your word. Give us and grant to us your peace that passes all understanding in these days. Help us to be reminded, God, you are in control of all things. And God, we do not need to fear what we're facing in this world. And Lord, I do pray that you'd speak to hearts. If there's someone here today that is lost and needs to be saved, let today be the day of salvation in their life. Bless us now, Lord, I pray, and bless the day, especially, Lord, the time that will take place at 2 o'clock. I pray you'd bless the funeral service. And God be with Brother Mike and his family, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The portion that I've read to you from God's Word this morning can be labeled as Bible prophecy. The purpose of Bible prophecy is not to scare us, but to enlighten us and to assure our hearts before God. It is not to make us or to cause us to make, I should say, a calendar of events, but to build character in our heart, to draw us closer to the Lord. It is not given to bother us, but to bless us. Again, for I have read and, and, and heard this many times in recent months. You've heard me say this a few weeks ago, maybe, uh, and read similar headlines uh, in the last few weeks about what we're experiencing in America being uh, uh, an, an apocalypse or uh, Armageddon, you know, in, in nature. And some of them, you know, worded in the correct way, but some of them are actually calling this Armageddon and the apocalypse. And uh, let me remind you, and we're preaching on this thought this morning, this is not that. Amen. What we are facing is not what the world is going to face in time to come. I think many uh, say such things because of what we read in the book of Revelation. And while I would agree that there are some similarities uh, in what we read there, and I'm going to go to that in just a moment, in what we're facing today, uh, there are some great similarities, uh, but this is not the great tribulation that is spoken of beginning in Revelation chapter number 6. Now, how do I know this? I know this because of what the Bible teaches us here in our text that I've read to you, and I want to get to that in just a moment, and we will. But first, uh, let, us, let us look and pull out, if you will, a section from the book of Revelation, a part of the great tribulation known as the judgment of God or the judgments of God upon the nation. Beginning in Revelation chapter number 6, there are seven sealed judgments in the book, in a book that was there and presented there, beginning there in chapter 6. Those seven seals are opened by one who the Bible says was worthy to open the book, amen, one who was as a lamb that had been slain. Now we know who that one is, amen. There's not but one who is a lamb that was slain, amen, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. So he alone was the worthy one to open the book. And we look and see those seven sealed judgments in a book, beginning in Revelation chapter 6. Those seven seals are opened by that one that was worthy, the seventh one of those seals. Think about this. Opened up and revealed seven more judgment, trump, trumpet judgments, if you will, and then the seventh trumpet, when it sounded, opened up a seven vile, bold judgment, vile judgments. And, uh, but again, as we look at these in, in nature this morning, the similarities, again, I remind you, this, what we're facing right now presently, is not that which is going to come. Now, I'm going to give you a brief, quick rundown, very quick rundown of what will take place during that moment of things to come, begin, beginning with the seal number one in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2. So if you don't have time to write all this down, because I'm going to go pretty fast right now, then, uh, then you can watch the video later on this afternoon, and uh, you can write it down then and look at it in further study. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2, seal number 1, the white horse representing the time of false conquest and false peace. This rider is not Jesus Christ. He is conquering and to conquer, 
coming to conquer and to uh, conquering and to conquer, sort of like an oxymoron. You can't do both. You can't conquer and 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 and, and be conquering and be conquered yourself. So this is not the Christ. Reve seal number two, Revelation six and verse four. Red horse, peace is taken, murder takes over. Seal number three, Revelation chapter six, verse five and six, black horse, rider on the black horse, famine and economic disaster begins. Seal number four, Revelation chapter six, verses six through eight, a pale horse whose, whose rider and the name of that rider is death and hell. Power is given there to one-fourth of the earth to kill for him to kill one-fourth of the earth with sword, hunger, death, and beast. Seal number five, Revelation chapter six, verses nine through 11, a martyred remnant comes forward and is recognized. Seal number six, Revelation chapter six, verses 12 through 17, a great earthquake, total eclipse, moon becoming as blood, total anarchy takes over in the world. Seal number seven, which is begins in Revelation chapter eight, verses one through five, is open and revealing the seven angels with the seven trumpets, opening up seven more judgments that are to come, signified by the blowing of a trumpet. Trumpet number one, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7, hail, fire with blood, one-third of all trees and all grass is burned up with fire. Revel uh, Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, trumpet number 2 is sounded, one-third of the sea becomes as blood. One-third of the sea life dies. One-third of all ships are destroyed. Trumpet number three, Revelation chapter 8 and verse number 10. One-third of all part of all waters become bitter, killing many men, the Bible says. Trumpet number four sounds in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 12. One-third of the sun, moon, and stars are darkened, which gives us light, gives, gives the fact that one-third of the day and night are gone. Someone said recently, boy, the days are getting shorter signifying the end of the times. No, the days are getting shorter because fall and winter are coming. Amen. <laughs> Trumpet number five, Revelation chapter nine, verses one through 11. First of four woes are given. Locust-like scorpions come upon and describe for us a very dreadful time of torment that'll take place during this time of tribulation. Trumpet number six is sounded, Revelation chapter nine, verses 12, all the way through verse number 21. One third part of all men die. Think about that. One third of all the population of the world at that time dies. Trumpet number seven is sounded, beginning Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, all the way through Revelation chapter 15. The seventh trumpet sounds, the great dragon is revealed, the beast, the seven last plagues, unleashing the wrath of God as never witnessed before on the face of the earth. And also, that seventh trumpet opens up seven more vile judgments that are to be released, or if you will, poured out on the earth. Vile number one, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 2, the mark of the beast comes on the scene is revealed. Vial number two, Revelation chapter 16 and verse three. The rest of the sea is turned into blood, killing all remaining sea life that is there. Vial number three, Revelation chapter 16 and verse four. The rest of the rivers and water sources of the world become as blood. Vial number four, Revelation chapter 16 and verse number eight. Men are scorched with great heat. Vial number five is poured out, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 10. Total darkness upon the kingdom of the beast. His people gnaw at their tongues for pain and sores that are inflicting them. Vial number seven, excuse me, vial number six, Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 through 16. The drying up of the great river Euphrates, preparing, if you will, the passageway for the battle of Armageddon to take place. Vial number seven, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 17, there's recorded there thunders and lightnings, great earthquake like never before, great hailstones, think about this, weighing as much as 100 to 200 pounds are falling from the earth that is to come. And again, I remind you, this, what we're facing in the world right now, 
is not that which is to come. Obviously, we are seeing what we are seeing going on today in our world is nowhere near the force and the magnitude that will come upon the nations of the world in that day. Amen. Now let's go back to our text in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. How do I know that this is not that? Of course, we've just given you some of the reason there in Revelation. But notice in our text, beginning in chapter 2 and verse number 1, I know this is not that because the church has not been raptured out. Amen. Amen. We could also go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. I may read that passage of Scripture today at the graveside. I do that oftentimes. Reminding us there's going to be a great reunion one day. Revelation chapter number 4, verse number 1 is also a reference to the rapture that is to come. The Holy Spirit here in our text through the pen of Paul is seeking to bring peace. Now I want you to think about that peace upon the church. Notice if you will in chapter 2 and verse number 2. Here we have description for us in detail of how God wants to give us peace in this day and hour. That you be not soon shaken in mind. There's a lot of people that are soon shaken in mind by what's going on in the world. This means the turmoil of the mind. Uh, they are troubled. This means a mental cry, neither by spirit nor by word. Notice what he says here, nor by letter as from us. Paul is saying, what I'm writing here to you this morning, what I'm giving to you here, what you're reading and what your preacher is preaching from this morning is not given to us to shaken us in mind and to give us trouble in heart and fear, but to enlighten us and to bring peace in our heart and mind, knowing that this is not that which is to come, and there's coming a day, amen, hallelujah, we're going to be raptured out of this world into the next world, and God's going to rescue us from all of this nonsense that's going on in the world right now, amen. amen. It ought to bring f peace, peace to our heart that God is giving us here a word from heaven, amen, the church uh, his church, amen, the Lord's going to uh, catch us up. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Notice in our text in verse number 1, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice this phrase, and our gathering together unto him. That gathering together unto him is going to come, amen, when the rapture takes place. So shall we ever be with the Lord, amen, and meet the Lord in the air. I'm looking forward to that day. I've often wondered, wouldn't it be wonderful it wouldn't hurt my feelings any. I would rejoice with the Glasgow family if it took place at 2.05 this afternoon at the graveside of Oakwood Cemetery. Amen. amen. I'd rejoice. I'd wave at Sister Kim as we go through the air. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of you get a hold of this tonight in the middle of the night. You'll wake up and you'll go to shouting and you'll think another earthquake has taken place. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I'm enjoying myself if you're not. This is the next great, the rapture of the church is the next great and one event that is to take place on the calendar of God. When the church is out of, out of the world, go back to our text, Satan and his forces will start their program that is allotted by God's permission. It will be a time of great tribulation upon the earth. And what I describe for you in the introduction of our message in Revelations chapter 6 through 19 cover this time primarily the last three and a half years. And presently in our world right now, think about it, there is a restraining force, combination of the church and the Holy Spirit that is in this world through the people of God. And imagine what this world would be like, dear friend, if it were not for the Holy Spirit being here and present and working in our lives and working in this world and restraining this world from doing all that human nature would allow it to do. Amen. There's going to come a time, though, verse 6 and 7, in which that restraining force will be taken away. In spite of the church's faults, and she has many, and spiritual weaknesses, which are many as well, we ought to not ever underestimate the presence of the church in the world, the people of God, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the world. The presence of the church has a delay, if you will, upon what is coming and what is going to happen to this world. Lot, I remind you, was not a dedicated man by no means. But the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah did not come until Lot was removed and taken out of the way. Nothing upon God's schedule will be delayed. When the church is gone 
and the Holy Spirit is taken away, the mystery of iniquity will be revealed and the next events of God's purposes will begin to take place, dear friend. This is not that because the rapture has not taken place yet. Number two, how do I know this is not that? Because of what we read here in our text in verses 3 through 5 in the beginning of verse number 8, the Antichrist has not yet been revealed. Now there's a lot of people that believe that he's, uh, I read somewhere years ago that uh, think this name is right, Henry Kissinger. They used to think that he was the Antichrist. Is he still alive? Does anyone know? Is he still alive? I don't know. Uh, I, he, I don't know. I'm getting nods and shakes, so we don't know. Amen. But uh, they used to think that he was the Antichrist. I do not believe that Henry Kissinger is the Antichrist by no means. When Hitler was on the scene, they used to think that he was the Antichrist. Mussolini and other ones have been named the Antichrist through the year. Paul does not use the term Antichrist in our text here, but he does use these terms. That man of sin, the son of perdition. Verse number 8, that wicked person. Satan has always been at war with God. Remember that. Never forget that. He's still presently at war with God right now as I'm preaching this message. Remember that Satan wanted to be worshipped and served as God himself. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 14 gives reference to that. Satan will one day produce his man of the hour, the Antichrist, who will deceive the world to worship and serve Satan and believe all of his lies. He will especially uh, deceive the people uh, of this day and hour who have, if you will, had a chance, heard the gospel of Christ, and had a chance to be saved and making them think, well, I'll wait. There's some that probably right now presently are thinking, well, I, I'm not worried about all that. When it all takes place, I'll just wait till the, and take the mark of the, and not take the mark of the beast, be killed. And the Bible gives us reference here, if you will, verse 10 and 11, that that man, the Antichrist, will deceive them and they will believe a lie. Dear friend, let me remind you here this morning, right now, if you're here and you're not saved and you're not sure that you're saved by the grace of God, you better not put it off. You're giving, you're giving a day of grace right now to believe, right now to believe. Amen. You better believe. You better trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and not, you know, not take your chances in that way. I think there were some movies out. I don't know the names of them. I won't name those movies that sort of gave that deception in that way. I think that what we're rightly interpreting the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth, verse 10 and 11, let me read it. It says, and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive, notice this, receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved right now. If you're here right now, you have the opportunity to be saved. If you're not saved, you have an opportunity to, to receive the word of truth, amen, the love of the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a, God, believe a lie. God, through that Antichrist, will cause that great day. See, John told us, I remind you, that the Antichrist shall come. He also said in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, Dear friend, he said, even now, now, presently, there are many Antichrists, plural, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, some of those people that we mentioned by name, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't think Kissinger would necessarily would have been one in this way. I think it's because he was a Jew. People tried to tie him into all of this. But I think that um, some of those people might have been antichrist in nature, in spirit, in type, because of their love of wanting to be worshipped themselves. And their ability to deceive so many people. And their ability not only to deceive, but to deceive those people and to do their work, their individual work, their ambition, their promotion of death and, and, and the killing and the murder of many innocent people. Amen. So Hitler, I guess you could say, was very antichrist in nature. But he was not the antichrist. Which presents a question to us. Is the Antichrist presently living in our world? The answer to that is this. Maybe. Right. I don't know. He might be. 
possible. But for sure there have been many and are today many still with that spirit of Antichrist. 1 John 4 and verse 3 reminds us even now already is in the world that spirit of Antichrist. So we're given a description though in God's word. What's this man going to be like when he does come into being? Well, let me give it to you quickly. Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 1 and 2. He will be a peacemaker. Our world, think about it, America and our world right now is set, set for a man like this to come on the scene. It's perfect. It's ripe right now. Can you imagine one man come on the scene and say, hey, I've got the answer to all of your problems, and I know how to cure all of this and take care of all of this, and more people would flock to him in groves and multitudes because this world right now is begging for peace to come. Number two, he will be a protector. You'll have to go to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 through 27. We're not going to read that for the sake of time. But he will grant a temporary solution to the Middle East crisis that's been here as long as I can remember. And when I was studying history in school, it was there. <laughs> then we were reminded of it. There's still a problem in the Middle East, but there's coming a day this man will grant some temporary peace and solution to the Middle East crisis. But then, just as he granted it, number three, he will be a peace breaker. He will break every agreement that he made with the Jew in Israel in that time. After three and a half years of peace, he will break his agreement with the Jewish people. He will organize, if you will, a one church, one world church, a one world government that will worship Satan. Can I tell you that spirit is already here as well? Wouldn't it be nice, they say, if we could just have one leader of the whole world? Wouldn't it be nice, they say, if we could just have one currency for the whole world? Wouldn't it be nice, they say, if we could just have one church and we all just get together and agree in harmony and sing Kumbaya? Amen. <laughs> he, the Antichrist, under the direction of Satan will perform great signs and wonders and deceive the nations. Number four, he will be a great persecutor of all. Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 through 17. He will, through the mark of the beast, control the world's economic system. Yet miraculously, there will be some saved during this period. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. But it will cost them their life. Those who refuse to take the mark of the beast and bow to him will be slain and left in the streets. He will be a prisoner in his final days of this world. Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 through 21 and Revelation 20, the first part of it. He and Satan will not be in control forever. Can somebody please say amen? Amen. God has a purpose and a place for the both of them, and it's called the bottomless pit. Amen. <laughs> Going to fall and keep falling. <laughs> bottomless pit. And then number three, finally, I know this is not that, because one day Christ will return to this earth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. Victory, final victory will come. Amen. The return of Christ is quite different from the rapture of the church by Christ. The first, the rapture will be secret, but the second will be public. The Bible tells us that Jesus, and the angel said, that why stand ye here gazing up in the heaven, the same Jesus will come as he went. One of these days, he's coming back to this earth. Amen. Amen. The first, the rapture, as I said, will be secret. The second will be public. And we know that Christ will have the final word. Paul briefly writes about this in 2 Thessalonians when he tells us that Christ will notice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, he will judge the Antichrist and Satan, but he will also judge the unsaved, verses 10 through verse number 12. Now in our final three or four verses, Notice that Paul gives a word for all believers that are, I believe, presently right here. Here's our word in brief to us. Notice in verses 13 and 14, 
you and I who are here on this earth that are Christians, we ought to be very grateful. Can I say that again? Very grateful that we are assured that we are saved and we are born again and we have the Holy Spirit assured in our hearts this morning. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I know that I'm saved. I'm glad, sister, that I know that Christ is in my heart living and dwelling. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness that my, with my spirit right now as I'm preaching this message that I am a child of God. Amen. I'm glad of that. Paul was grateful for God that God had saved these believers at Thessalonica. And he reminds them here in these couple of verses <clears throat> that God had personally dealt with them through the presence of the Holy Spirit. We must not ever forget uh, that the gospel of Christ finds its motivation through the love of God. We're reminded in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we're reminded in Romans chapter 8, is what, chapter 5 and verse number 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. God had saved them. God had called them. God has saved us. God did deal with us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. I remind myself that as a nine or ten year old boy setting it out to my whole Baptist church, there was a moment in my life that God the Holy Spirit revealed to me that I was lost and needed to be saved, prompted me and I got up out of my pew and went forward and got born into the family of God. I'm so grateful for that day that I was saved by the grace of God. And dear friend, this is something that all Christians should eternally be grateful for, especially during this time. Someone said, how much of the news have you watched lately? I said, as little as I possibly can. Amen. I don't have to watch the news to know that everything's all right in my heart. And I certainly don't need the news bringing any more fear into my life. Amen. I have other people that do that for me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Verse 15. A word for believers. We need to be grateful and thankful. A word for believers. We need to stand fast in these last days. What does it say in verse 15? Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, we need to understand this word traditions here is bringing up an interesting point, but it's not tradition as we would think of. He's not saying hold fast, amen, to having homecoming the third Sunday in May, amen. We didn't even get to have it this year, amen. Still saved though, amen. I still ate on that day. I don't remember what I ate, but I still ate and enjoyed my time with the Lord, amen. But we, did not, we were not able to have homecoming. That's a tradition. And some people didn't like what I just said, but it's just a tradition, amen. What is he talking about here? With well, a future coming that involves the likes of Satan and the Antichrist, it is time that you and I stood fast as Christians. Stood fast. Satan does his best work, if you will, by infiltrating churches, Christian colleges, Christian schools, and tries to infiltrate our family to divide and conquer. He likes to take churches and turn them into a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. The word traditions, as I've said, brings up an interesting point. We must all make sure that which has been handed down from person to person, that's what this word tradition means, is rooted, and Paul makes recognition of this in the latter part of verse number 15 where it says, which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle, and so we need to make sure that that which we are standing firm and standing fast on and has been handed down to us by tradition is rooted and grounded in God's Word. And we need to stand fast, but we need to make sure that we're standing and our standing has its foundation on the Word of God, amen, and not the tradition of men. And there's a lot of that that's been dividing us in the latter years and presently. But what Stan, what did Preacher Ross used to say? The book, the blood, and the blessed hope. I don't know if it was quite in that order, but that was his three alliterated B points, amen, for that message of standing, amen. That's good. In verse 16 and 17, notice finally, we have consolation and comfort in our hearts. What is he saying here? 
Verse 16, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us and have given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your heart, establish you in every good word, good word and work. It is not only good to know the truth and stand fast for the truth, to know that we're saved and stand fast for the truth, but I think what he's saying here in verse 16 and 17 is in these last days we better be applying the truth. Application of truth, what does it do? What is he talking about here? Application of truth in our heart is what brings consolation and comfort to my heart. I know I say a lot about this, but when I go, and, and you and I, and, and people of the world, people of Christians as well, and we go home and, we, and we're looking for some peace, we're looking for some comfort, we're looking for consolation, and so we grab the remote and we click. And we click. And we click. And we keep clicking and we run through all the major news channels and we're still not finding any comfort and we're still not finding any consolation. So we put that up and we grab a mobile device or we get behind a computer and we start searching and we're looking on our social networking places and we're looking for peace and consolation there. And it's possible there might be somebody on there that's given a good word of edification that might be able to bring in a little hope if it's rooted and grounded back to the previous point in God's Word. But dear friend, there is nothing in this world, and I remind you, there is nothing in this world that can take the place of simply you and I in this time of trouble and turmoil, getting along with God, opening up God's Word. I hope you're listening to me this morning. Opening up God's Word for yourself and reading it and gleaning from it, and begging God to give you a word from heaven, from it, amen, that'll bring that comfort and bring that consolation to your heart because there's nothing in this world that can do it, amen. amen. Nothing in this world can do it. You may pick up the phone and you may try to call Preacher Perkins, but he's unavailable. You may try to text me and he doesn't text you back directly in an instant. You're looking for a word. You're looking for comfort and consolation. It's there. It's given to us. Amen. In the holy word of God. Look to God. God can grant it to you. Amen. Through his word and through the presence of the Holy Spirit. You see, these two words are very close in meaning consolation and comfort. Together they mean this. To call alongside of and console and comfort and encourage the best description is like this. When you were sick and you was a little child and you did something that, that you hurt yourself, whether it was fall off your bicycle or you was riding and your uh, shoestring got caught in the chain and you had a bad wreck, you didn't come running to daddy because daddy just say, it'll be all right, amen, and pat you on the head and send you on your way. You went running to mama because mama would put you in the lap, mama would put you on the counter and she would say, let's, let's kiss it, let's make it feel better. That's what that word means, those two words together. It means someone is calling us alongside of them and they're comforting us, they're kissing us, they're making it feel all better, amen. amen. And that's what I'm looking for in this world and I find it in my relationship with Jesus and his word. You see, this helps, notice the last word, we're, we're, we're done. This helps to establish not establish, don't change the word of God, establish, amen. It means to make stable, place firmly, set and strengthen. What is he strengthening? What is he firmly placing? Our desire, notice if you will, in every good word and work. I've said it before, let me just say it again. The work of the Lord must continue on in these days. The church needs to be active. Not hiding in a cave somewhere, but active. We need to be sending out these any way we can. This, this video tracks any way we can get the word of God out. Actively being involved in the work of the Lord and not hiding ourselves like a hermit. Amen. These days are not days we must sit idly by doing nothing. We must be active in the Lord's work. And God can in may protect us. And if he doesn't, when we go home, what have we lost? <laughs> I haven't lost anything. I've gained a lot. Yeah. Amen. That doesn't mean I'm going to go out in this world and be stupid. It does mean I'm going to exercise common sense and I'm going to try with the, God's ability to go through 
every open door he gives me. I want to, any open heart that I feel like he's opened for me to give a good word. I'm not going to fear that I'm going to catch something, but I'm going to try to give a good word of God to that heart that's open. Amen. Amen. I think the, word, the Lord has given us a word. Amen. Not from your preacher, but from his word, his eternal word. And I hope it has helped you this morning. Let's stand to our feet. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. And Lord, we, to the best of our ability, have preached Lord, the message you've given and laid upon our heart. And we trust, O oh Lord, you would speak to hearts and change lives. Help us, Lord, to get a hold of what's said in your word today from this text. And not be gripped and ripped open by fear that has been imparted to this world at this present time. God, help us to find comfort and consolation in the presence of the Holy Ghost and the eternal Word of God, knowing that all things are in your control. And there is a day coming. This is not that. But there is a day coming, Lord, that will be great tribulation. But I'm grateful, Lord, for the eternal promise. Lord, I'll watch it from the portals of glory. And be grateful that as a ten-year-old boy, I gave my heart to you and was saved. Father, if there's someone here this morning that is not saved, I pray that today would be the day of salvation in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.